Well, hello there, friends. <laughs> different concept today, different setup today. I'm at home. I decided to do the first Q&A at home. You guys have asked so many fabulous questions. I am so happy, I cannot tell you. Relax, glass of Chardonnay. I figure we have a talk. Get yourself a glass of wine and let's drink and let's enjoy yourself. God bless America, God bless the world. We certainly need a lot of blessing right now. Friends, let me start with a few questions. You've asked so many of them. I picked the most asked question. Uh, and I'm going to say the name and forgive me because I'm going to massacre your name. Forgive me. Uh, Down uh, Pandemonia. Bart Omant, Ari Mann, Kono Handley ask a lot of the same questions, so I bind them into one. I, and likely all the other fans, would love to hear your story of getting interested in cooking, becoming a chef, and then a teacher, and know the motivations behind that. Why did you decide to move to the US? Who were your major influences? I love to hear some stories you have about coming to America as a French chef and any challenge you face along the way. I am sure with 50 plus years in the game, you have story to tell. So, friends, there is so much to tell you. There is so much to tell you. How did they all start? Well, I'm lucky enough, my mom was a Cordon Blue chef. So my mom was an amazing chef, a beautiful, gentle, kind being. She was wonderful. She loved everybody. She, she always told me that I could do anything I wanted, or I had to do with work for it. And then, of course, it was her mom, an Italian grandmother. My grandmother did not speak Italian. She did not speak French. She only spoke Italian. So she taught me the fundamentals of Italian cuisine. Then it was my uncle, the bread maker, René. He was the best ouvrier de France. That means one of the best French makers in, 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 in France. Then I was five, six years old, I would get up in the middle of the night and make bread with him. <laughs> then at 14 years old, I started my formal apprenticeship at Lustar de Beaumanier, a three-star Michelin star restaurant. Then I worked at the Carlton Hotel in Cannes, then the Moulin de Mugin, another three-star Michelin star restaurant with Roger Verger, the leader of Nouvelle Cuisine. Then I started working on a cruise ship for a couple of years. That made me discover America. <laughs> that brought me right there to the Fort Lauderdale. I was in my early 20s with just $300 in my pocket. <laughs> a couple of years later, I opened up my first restaurant, The Left Bank, which became quickly one of the best restaurants in America. I hosted a cooking series on PBS, wrote three cookbooks. I have a cooking series on PBS and was lucky enough to be nominated by the James Beer Foundation for the best culinary videos. I retired from the restaurant business in 1997. And for a fun retirement gig, I decided to open a cooking, a cooking school. It was so much fun that I kept it going for 22 years. Then COVID came, COVID came and disturbed, disturbed us all. I retired again. This time, as a retirement gig, I started the YouTube channel. And I can tell you, my friends, that retirement gets better every time you do it. This is the most rewarding experience of my life. The difference, uh, the, the, the difference is the difference that I make in, in sharing my experience, my 50 years experience in a kitchen is just amazing. So I am so happy to have this opportunity to share with you and to have fun with you and i know a lot of you appreciate it so this is a quick synopsis of my 50 years how did i get here i don't want to bore you too much with too many details so let's get into some other questions so we have alex villanueva i hope i said it correctly my question is actually for both of you that's Jack and I. Can you gentlemen share with us 
when and where the two of you first met and how you were able to, found, to form a good relationship with each other. Well, I met Jack about 17 years ago. So I guess he was four or five years old. He, was the, he is the son of my girlfriend, uh, Leanne, and has been my girlfriend for 17 years. And uh, we have started working together about three years ago. Three years ago, he came to me and he says, I need a job. I don't want a favor, I want a job. I said, well, we're gonna be starting a YouTube channel. We're gonna need an editor. What do you know about editing? Not much, but I can learn. As you can see, he's learned a lot. And he's been fantastic to work with. It's been a great pleasure. He's learning every day. Studying everything, studying sound, studying lighting, studying camera work. He's doing a fantastic job. A lot of people have asked, when are we gonna see him in front of the camera? Well, he's a little shy. You know, 22 years old, I was shy too. But he will be in front of the camera one day. We don't know exactly what he's gonna do, but he's working on it. He's promised me that one day he's going to be in front of the camera when he feels like it. So we're looking forward to it. Next question. J Dancer 47 Hi, Chef and Jack. I absolutely love the channel. My question is, when... Oh, <laughs> I already answered that question. When can we see Jack on camera? I already answered it. All right, next question. This one is from Q Levy. I don't know how to say it. Um, some may say that cutting speed is determined by the experience of a cook. And maybe there is actually a method to improve the speed of cutting things. I already touched that in the, um, in the knife cutting scale, but you may not have seen this. So I recommend you watch it because yes, indeed, it is about experience. Very simple, friends. The, um, very simple. The idea is to make sure when you cut, any vegetables, anything. And if you're gonna use the claw, you don't necessarily need the claw all the time. But if you wanna go fast, you need the claw. We're talking about slicing and dicing. The secret is very simple. And you watch that video, uh, uh, Jack is gonna give you a link in it. It's uh, to make sure the knife is right against the knuckle. The first or the second knuckle, whichever one you use. I use this one, the middle knuckle. And as long as your knife is constantly touching, you know exactly where you are at all times because you know where the knife, you don't need to look. You know the knife is right there. As long as you feel the cold steel on your knuckle, you can go up and down, up and down, up and down. And as long as you, you're touching, you know where you are, you don't need to cut, you're not going to cut yourself. And that is the only way you're not going to cut yourself. You have to be careful and you have to practice slowly. Don't try to go fast first. Go slow. Slow and good. Slow and perfect. Don't try to go too fast because you're going to be sloppy and your knife is not going to touch. You see somebody who's not experienced, their knife is close to the finger but not touching. It's impossible to do it. You have to have the knife against. Don't be afraid. You're not going to cut yourself. All right? But watch that video, friends. A lot of people have asked that question, so I'm glad I answered it. So now, another question from K. Bach. Which of your recipes do you really love and you feel did not get received or did not receive the, 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 the success it deserved? Well, there is a few of them. And you know what happened is when we started the channel two and a half years ago, is when we did all those fantastic recipes. And what happened is a lot of you look forward to the new recipe, the new release every week on Monday and Thursday, but you don't look back at what we did two and a half years ago and some of our best recipes are there. So I highly recommend it, friends, you go backward once in a while and go back and see the old one. I'm gonna give you a few of my favorite that really did not get any coverage at all. The stuffed portobello mushroom, phenomenal recipe, so easy. The beauty about this recipe, you can make it in advance. All you gotta do at the last minute, you know, arugula salad, put it on top and it's fantastic. The cherry clafouti, black cherry clafouti custard pie. A child could do it, <laughs> but it's true, a child could do this one. It's so simple, you gotta try to make. We'll give you the link down there for, so you can all see it. The cheese souffle that never falls. That is a fantastic recipe. As an appetizer, as a side, it's fantastic and it's so easy to make. The chocolate truffle and my chocolate fondant. The chocolate fondant has to be my favorite dessert of all time. And it takes minutes to make it. Literally, this one, believe it or not, imagine friends, we have almost 1,300,000 subscribers. That video only got 59,000 subscribers. 
uh, fala, uh, give, uh, read, uh, view. I can't speak this morning. Maybe it's the wine. Maybe I didn't have enough. To your good head, my friend. Mmm. Delicious. Uh, 59,000 view out of 1,300,000. That shows you that I didn't get any view and it's my favorite dessert of all time and it's so simple to make. This is like a no-brainer. Remi uh, Jack reminded me the other day we had a party of 20 people, friends, and, uh, and they ate all the first dessert I did. I said, I gotta make something else. 15 minutes, I had 20 uh, chocolates full down right into it. It's so easy to make, you gotta look into it. Um, also a recipe that didn't get much uh, uh, view is uh, the chicken sausage jambalaya. Oh, one pot, amazing. And the last one, I mean, a lot of him, but last one, uh, creamy polenta. I make a polenta, then it's like the most amazing polenta you've ever had. You make this with a garlic shrimp, I promise you, you'll make it again with, with lamb, with steak, with anything. It's really, really amazing. That goat cheese polenta recipe is amazing. It's my mom's recipe. And I'm telling you, I've never had a better polenta. Never. Most polenta, you go to a restaurant, they make it with water. Water? And you know I don't use water. Yeah, I use a little butter and nice cheese and the chicken stuff. It's amazing. You gotta try it. All right, friends. Also, same K bar question. Also, is there any recipe off limit that you do not want to cook? Well, <laughs> I don't like certain food products. As a chef, I should be ashamed, master, especially as a French chef. But I don't like oyster. I mean, I don't mind cooking them like an oyster Rockefeller. Oh, I love oyster Rockefeller. It's wonderful, right? Uh, but I don't like the texture of a raw oyster. Like, I could, could do it. Liver? I don't like liver. My mom would always make liver so delicious, but I don't like it. I don't like the texture of it. The flavor is wonderful, no like texture of it. Uh, tripes. Have you ever had tripes? Oh, that's very Italian. When my mom would make tripes, it would smell three blocks away. I don't like the smell. I don't like the flavor. I don't like the texture. Lamb testicle. <laughs> Do you see that? There's people that cook testicle this day. There's a, I'm telling you, there's some on YouTube. There's this guy, I'm cooking lamb testicle. No, not for me, I'm not doing them. I leave them where they belong. Yeah? Kidneys, I don't like kidneys. Sweetbreads, I don't like sweetbreads. I don't like the texture of some foods. So, I guess I'm more American than I am French. I gotta tell you. All right, then another question, friends. Uh, Drama Dudes, Drama Dudes 83. 23, that's his name. Drummer dudes. I guess it's a drummer, friends. Let me see. Yes. Are you afraid of running out of recipe and idea for doing, since you're doing two amazing thank you videos a week? How do you decide what to make for each video? And it becomes a little bit of an issue sometimes, friends, because uh, I know that so many recipes have so many great techniques, but so many of you have not seen it because they're your new subscribers or you just haven't got to it yet. And so, and I think it's important to do, but there's only so many ways to make a red wine reduction. There's only so many ways to make a mac and cheese. There's only so many ways to make a beef stew. It comes to the end of it, you, gotta, well, you know, I'm gonna invent a few stews, I'm gonna invent a few stews. So yes, once in a while, it's a little challenge. And I wanna do things that are gonna be uh, popular. I wanna, be, I wanna do things that are gonna be easy for you to do. I don't wanna do things that are so complicated that you're not gonna do it. So yes, once in a while, that's why I love to hear what you wanna do. So remember, constantly send us, hey, do this, do this. You know how many good shows I have done because of you guys asking for it? A lot of great ideas uh, 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 that you guys have said, why don't you do this? And I did it and wow, it was a great success. So uh, please keep sending them in. Gary M, what is the meal you cook most often for yourself and your family? You know, I do easy things. Uh, most of the time I eat leftover of the show than we did the day before because it's always extra. But I love scrambled eggs when I don't know what to cook. I go in and I always got eggs. You can put a bunch of stuff on scrambled eggs. Stir fry. I love making a stir fry. Get your good protein and whatever you got, you put in it. The secret of having fun in the kitchen is to know what to do with the ingredients. Frittata. I love making a frittata. It's so easy. It's another recipe that you guys have not seen. A lot of you have not seen. It probably got 100, 150,000 views out of 1,300,000. Frittata is a must, friends. You can make it on Sunday and you have it for two or three days for lunch. It's wonderful with a little salad. Fantastic. 
uh, I love making steak au poivre. When I'm going to make a steak, uh, uh, I'm going to make a, a, a New York sweep or a ribeye or a filet mignon. I'm going to make it with the peppercorn sauce. I love making that. Uh, of course, I eat a lot of fish. We're in Florida. We eat a lot of fish, even if it's not a snapper or a mahi or, or salt fish. I love salmon. Uh, so many ways to make fish. I love salmon. Bolognese. Bolognese. I love bolognese. I've made two or three videos on bolognese uh, with a sausage bolognese. I made one not too long ago. I've released it. I hope you guys watch it. It's fantastic. So I make that a lot. And when I make, I make a big batch because you can stuff zucchini, you can stuff peppers, you can stuff tomatoes, you can add beans and make a dish. Of, so out of one, one bolognese, you can make a multitude of dishes. You make it, make it a big pot and freeze it. All right. Um, then another a question from, oh, that's going to be a tough name to, to say. Kureyami Shikaku. Shikaku. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Forgive me. Uh, all of your dishes you've created in your career, which one is the one you're most proud of it and why? Wow. Well, I certainly have created a lot, lots of dishes. Uh, in, my, in my cooking career, indeed. And the restaurant was certainly a place to create. But one of the dishes that I did, that I was the most proud of it, was my um, duck breast stuffed with a, uh, a duck leg confit uh, with caramelized onion and shallots and wrapped with bacon served with a port wine reduction on top of a rutabaga and, um, and parsnip, uh, or no, not rutabaga, and uh, celery root puree. That dish is like magic in your, in your mouth. Between the duck breast that is cooked perfect medium, medium rare, to the duck confit that melts in your mouth and the caramelized onion and the vegetables, it's an amazing dish. And, and that was one then, when I would do at the restaurant, uh, magazine wrote article about it when I would do at the school. Everybody would just love it. And I did it on the channel. Most people didn't look at it. <laughs> but that is one of the most unusual spots. When I cook for chefs and I want to impress, I do my stuff. Dark breast. It's wonderful. All right. Uh, another uh, uh, question from a somebody called Fonto, Fonto Fliff. 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 Again, forgive me. I'm terrible. All I can say is more recipe cooking with butter. I'm with you. But honestly, when is it better to use butter or clarified butter? And when is it better to use olive oil instead of in your cooking? What's your opinion when people use both to, for added flavor or richness in their food? As we know, on the last video that I did, butter is good for you. When do we use clarified butter versus regular butter? Well, butter has milk protein. When you do clarified butter, you remove the milk. So now all you have is butter fat. Butter fat is a very high smoke point, 450. Regular butter with the milk and it burns at 250 degrees. So it's very easy to understand. When you need to cook something, a high point like sauteing a steak, sauteing a fish, whatever it is, potatoes, whatever it is, so it's gonna be in a fry pan for a while. You don't want it to burn, so you use clarified butter. Otherwise, at the end of a sauce, you're not gonna cook it so high then you're gonna burn it. So you put whole butter because you want that milk protein. So that's really a quick explanation. Is it good to add both of them? You know, you know what I find a lot? I see people, then put the butter and they go, oh, put a little bit of olive oil. The butter is not going to burn. Butter burns because it's milk protein. I don't care if you're adding olive oil to it. The milk protein is still going to burn when it reaches 250 to 75. So putting the two of them for flavor, yes, but not to avoid the, the butter from burning. Quick answer. I hope you're satisfied with the answer. Uh, okay, another question from SRH. If you, could if you could choose only one breakfast, one dinner, one dessert to eat every day for the rest of your life, what would it be? Well, for breakfast, it would be a French toast with egg benedict. <laughs> I did a, a French toast and egg benedict for the dessert. It's breakfast for the rest of my life. I better have two of them, right? Uh, <laughs> for a main course, it would have to be a steak au poivre because I love steak au poivre. That would be that. And for dessert, it would have to be my melting chocolate cake or my chocolate mousse. All right. 
Another question from Bad Volley. Bad Volley uh, has been following us for many, many, many years since we started, two and a half, three years. Thank you for your content and your dedication toward teaching the whole world how to cook. You don't use garlic puree anymore. Why? When I started the, the channel, I introduced my famous garlic puree that I would use at the school because they were yet the same student and it was something I taught on a YouTube channel. And what happened is I found that as I was using it, a lot of the newcomer would come into the channel and go, what are you using? What's that garlic puree? So I would refer them to it, but it was not a success. So I decided to chop my garlic as I needed. But for those of you that are interested in that garlic puree, it's a fantastic recipe. It's just garlic cloves that we puree with olive oil and we make a paste and we use it in ice cubes, tray or in a little container in the freezer. And as we need it, we take it out and we use it. It's a fantastic way to introduce garlic. But that's the reason why I don't use it. Too many new subscribers on a regular basis. Every day we get 1,000, 1,500, 2,000, 3,000 new subscribers. And if I'm using it, they're not going to know what it is. And I don't want to refer them to making it. So that's why I don't use it that often anymore. Uh, oh, I lost my, my pay. Okay. You started shipping to other countries. Would you ship to Germany? We ship anywhere in the world, but the shipping charges are ridiculous. And we only charge the shipping charges that the post office charges us. And it's ridiculous. So if you want us to ship to certain thing to Germany or whatever, send us an email at uh, uh, YouTube at chefjp.com. YouTube at chefjp.com. Let us know what country you're in, what address you have, and what it is you would like us to ship. And then we'll tell you what the shipping charges would be based on what they're charging us and see if it's worth it shipping. Sometimes it might be better for you to find the product where you are in, your, in the country you are in. But thank you for asking. Um, also, would you ever do a, a meetup? I would fly to Florida to see you. Well, that's very kind of you, and I'm flattered. Uh, we will do that. We will organize a nice meetup. I'm not sure where, when, uh, but we're going to do it. I want to do it in a place where uh, you guys can experience my food, and we're going to have fun doing it. So I'm not sure when, but one of these days we're going to do it, I promise. All right? Uh, then we have another question from, and then I just have a few more questions, please. From I Zurus, I Zurus 312. What is the significance of a nice frame on the wall of the right of the sink? Well, to make it easy, friends, I bought it for those of you that may not have seen it. <laughs> it's a knife that I have, uh, uh, I have, uh, I have, uh, uh, was given to me by um, the uh, SOS Share a Strength Foundation. We uh, cooked a, a dinner for the victim of Hurricane Andrews. A few years ago, we had a big event with 60 chefs, 30 from uh, the state of Florida and 30 from out of state. Each the Florida chef invited an out of state chef. I invited Hubert Keller from uh, La Fleur de Lis in San Francisco, one of the greatest chefs that ever lived and stayed in America. I live in America, he owned one of the most romantic restaurants in America called La Fleur de Lis. Good friend of mine came down from Florida to from uh, San Francisco to help us raise money for the victim of Hurricane Andrews and they gave us this knife as a token of their appreciation. So that's why it's on the wall. All right. Uh, then we have a question from uh, Wabbit, W-A-B-B-I-T. After cooking the steak, oh, that's a good question. After cooking the steak, it should be left for resting. However, it turns cold, even using a tin foil to cover it, especially in winter. A chef's lamp is expensive, so what do I do? Well, friends, the reason why you let the steak Relax. Think about something. When you put a steak first in the oven or in, on the grill or in the fry pan, the juices runs away from the heat sources. Like you're putting a flame in front of a water, it runs away. It goes inside the steak and it, it gets inside the steaks. So what happens is when you take it out, the outside of the steaks are dried out. So you must let the juices redistribute from the center back into the center. I'm sorry, back into the outside. If you cut it right away, you're going to lose all the juices because it's in the center of it. You need to let it go back. And what it does, it redistributes 
we moisten the outside, and as it does this, it actually rises in temperature. A, a, a single steak or a single a breast of chicken will rise up to five to six degrees the first five minutes. It rises up. It doesn't go down in temperature right away. So, and, and, and a roast goes up for 10 to 15 minutes, goes up in temperature. So you let it rest, don't worry. You're not gonna let it get cold. It's not gonna get cold. 10 minutes is all you need. If you wanna lose all your juices, you cut it and that's no good. So it's most important. And I promise you, you don't lose temperature. You should check the temperature when you take it out and check it out. 10 minutes later, you'll see you lost maybe one or two degrees at the most. So it's really important to let it rest. All right. And, I, and one more, uh, uh, a few more questions. One question from uh, Hélène, 13. How do you peel and chop the onion without, without getting tears? Well, you wear contact lenses. <laughs> That's number one. If you don't wear contact lenses, you take one of those, friends. <laughs> there you go. The onion goggles. I promise you, they work wonderful. If you do any diving, diving goggles. The idea is to stop the gas that is released when you cut the onion, you, you, re you release the gas that react with the water in your eyes and that's why you cry. You wanna make sure that gas does not touch your, the, does not react with the water. Goggles or contact lenses, <laughs> no secret. Uh, another question, Alexandru Negru, is cooking art or science? That's a very good question. And it could take a whole show to explain it. My philosophy of it is, it is science before it can become art, I believe. The secret of good food is to be able to extract the maximum amount of flavor and texture out of the ingredients. And if you understand the science behind it, what does heat do, what does cold do, what does shape do of an ingredient, when you understand that, then you can create art based on what you know. Matter of opinion, I'm sure. There's some people that might have a different opinion. Mitch and Mickey. Since I was once a chef in the past, I just enjoy watching you and getting inspired all over again. I have always cooked, but got into the rut. You're making fun again. Thank you. You're making cooking fun again. Thank you, chef. Mitch and Mickey. This is why I do the channel. This is why I decided to do the channel. This is why I decided to do a cooking school when I retired for the second time. For the first time, sorry. I did the cooking school. Because it was fun to share my knowledge and get people excited about cooking because it doesn't take much. All it takes is just for you guys to do a few recipes and be successful and go, whoa, I can do that. Because at the end of the day, everybody can cook. Everybody thinks, some people think, oh, they're just born lousy cook. Well, guess what? Everybody's born lousy cook. Everybody's born a lousy tennis player. You become one. Everybody's born a lousy golfer. But you become one if you take the time to learn. Same thing about food. Get comfortable. Anybody can get in the kitchen and cook. It's so much more. And it's so rewarding. I don't think there is anything more rewarding than cooking for friends or family. So thank you for the for the note, and I'm so glad you're back in the kitchen. And I know a lot of you have done the same thing, so I'm so happy. And then uh, Mary Smith, and then a few more questions, and I'm done. Mary Smith, I'm so excited for your Q&A video, so I'm looking forward to it. Do you have a prep chef that helps for the videos, or do you do it all yourself? Well, I do all my prep myself. I love doing it, and it's fed, it's not that complicated. It's not like I'm cooking for, for 50, 100, 200, like in a restaurant, 500 people a night. You don't do that. You only cook for four people. It's a lot of fun to do. It's uh, it's it's puratic, pure, uh, therapeutic to me. I love it. I'm in my desk, I'm doing the paperwork. Oh, let me go to the kitchen and chop and dice for a couple of hours. I love it. I I don't do all my dishes. I don't do all my cleaning, uh, but I have a great assistant who's been with me for 30 years. Antonio is amazing. He, he, he takes care of all my stuff. He makes sure everything is perfect. So he's been with me for 30 years and I'm so proud to, to have him working with me. He's a wonderful man. So, but I do all of my chopping and dicing. He helps me over the eye with a lot of stuff. How does your cooking change over 50 years? Wow. How does cooking change in the last 50 years? Um, 
as cooking, not my cooking. My, my cooking has changed from classical to more fun. Um, but because years ago, you had to do something, you had to follow the recipe and that was it. If you made a tourno d'or rossini, you had to make a tourno d'or rossini. If you made a recipe, if you're a classic recipe, you had to make it the classic way, you could not deviate. Now you're having fun with it. Cooking today has changed where everybody's comfortable in the kitchen. People have realized any, any, any trade, anybody can become a great cook. A doctor can be a great cook. A plumber can be a great cook. An electrician can be a great cook. It doesn't matter what you do for a living. It's not that complicated. So what happened is I think we have to give the credit to the Food Network and then we have to give credit to YouTube that has been able to introduce cooking to so many of you. Now you can watch what you want, when you want. And, and you realize that it's not that complicated. So it has changed that way. 50 years ago, you would never, 50 years ago, you would never have heard of people cooking at home, doing these kind of things. They were cooking, of course, but it was completely different. Today, they can cook anything. They're comfortable doing anything. So it has changed a lot. All right, one, two more questions. TJ Johnson, I love the show. And what I want to know is, is your, it's your beef broth or your beef stock or your vegetable stock. That's what he wants to know. Forgive me, I bastardized the way I read the question, but he wants to see the chicken and beef broth recipe and a vegetable broth, which is the center of the cooking of all my dish. And you are right, uh, TJ Johnson, it is. And the reason why I answered your question is because we did two beef, two beef uh, uh, stock recipe two chicken stock recipe, one vegetable stock recipe, but you haven't seen them, so you're wondering that we should do them, and it's because a lot of you don't use the channel correctly, friends. In the channel, there is, um, uh, I forgot what they call, what the recipe are all put together, uh, playlist, 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 yes, playlist. And when you go to the channel, look at the playlist and you'll see all the stocks and soups are organized together, all the chicken are organized together, all the uh, seafood are organized together. But let's say you don't know where that is. Remember, in every channel, there is the search bar. You can type, and if you type, let's say you're looking for my chicken stock recipe, my beef stock recipe on YouTube, and you're not on our channel. You type Chef Jean-Pierre beef stock, Chef Jean-Pierre chicken stock. I promise you, you'll find it. And again, if you're having issue, you send us an email for those exact recipe you're looking for and we'll help you find them. All right, so thank you for the question. That was a great question. And final question, uh, PJ20, would like to know which of your dishes will freeze well for 17 years and which should not be frozen? <laughs> Funny question. Um, well, in, 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 in general, uh, food in submerged in liquid, like soups, like stocks, like stews that are submerged in liquid will last a long time in a freezer. Um, a, a long, long time in a freezer. Uh, food that are not wrapped correctly, whether it's air that gets to it, uh, or moisture gets to it, they get freezer burned, they don't last very long. So if you're gonna freeze something, then somehow make sure it's submerged in a liquid. It's a, a, like a sauce, a, a stew, freezers for a long, long time. I don't believe in freezing fish, or if you're gonna do it, you gotta do it very short time. Same thing with me, you gotta do it for a short time. All right, friends, many questions I've had. We, I think, about 400 questions. I only started a little bit. I didn't wanna bore you with more, but if you like this format, we'll do it again. So, to you, to your family, to all your friends, thanks for watching the channel. We are grateful of the support you gave us. And it's an amazing opportunity for a retired chef. I highly recommend for all the chefs that are thinking of retiring, start your own YouTube channel and share with everybody what you know. Thank you so much for watching. Remember, thumbs up if you like the video. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and ring that bell. God bless you all.